but I've, you know, TikTok thinks I'm trans for sure. Realizing I'm transgender was my personal 9-11. I was wondering if there's a manager I could talk to about something that happened. Yeah, I, I was called sir. Bitch, what, what about me says ma'am? Hey everybody, I'm Brad Palumbo and welcome back to the Damage Control Podcast where I'm reclaiming the LGBT community from the insane leftists and far-right extremists who are dominating the discourse on these important issues. Today, we're going to take a look at whether new Speaker of the House Mike Johnson is really the anti-gay bigot critics are making him out to be. Plus, we'll take a look at a recent clip of Joe Biden telling a story about his evolution on gay rights that is simply too good to be true. And, as always, We'll react to some insane woke LGBT TikToks because you guys, you enjoy watching me suffer. If you're new here, consider subscribing, commenting, liking, letting me know what you think of this show as you go on. And with that, let's hop into it. So the Republican Party is a bit of a mess when it comes to figuring itself out and its leadership, but they finally got a Speaker of the House not too long ago, and they put a representative named Mike Johnson, who was pretty popular, but most people hadn't heard of him. He wasn't a huge name as the new Speaker of the House to replace Kevin McCarthy. Now, Mike Johnson has come under a lot of scrutiny uh, for a couple different issues, but one that's relevant to our conversations we have here on this show, with many places like CNN and others digging up his old writings and statements about gay rights questions and issues. And frankly, a lot of what they found is really disturbing. In the early 2000s, Johnson worked with a group called the Alliance Defending Freedom, which is an ultra-conservative group, on, especially on social issues. And during his time with ADF, he wrote some pretty shocking things about the criminalization of homosexuality and gay marriage. CNN went and dug up some of these old quotes, and I, you can actually look. They're not taken out of context. You can look at the original sources. So I am going to read them from CNN, but I went through and, and checked them. Here's what he wrote, and let's discuss it, because it's not the kind of thing you'd expect to hear from a Republican today. In September 2004, Johnson wrote in support of a Louisiana amendment banning same-sex marriage, saying it could lead to people marrying their pets. Homosexual relationships are inherently unnatural, and the studies clearly show are ultimately harmful and costly for everyone, he wrote. Society cannot give its stamp of approval to such a dangerous lifestyle. If we change marriage for this tiny, modern minority, we will have to do it for every deviant group. Polygamists, polyamorists, pedophiles, and others will be next in line to claim equal protection. They already are. There will be no legal basis to deny a bisexual the right to marry a partner of each sex or a person to marry his pet. Johnson added that allowing same-sex marriage could be the downfall of the democratic system. He wrote, the state and its citizens have a compelling interest in preserving the integrity of the marital union by, uh, by making opposite sex marriage the exclusive form of family relationship endorsed by the government, he wrote. Loss of this status will de-emphasize the importance of traditional marriage to society, weaken it, and place our entire democratic system in jeopardy by eroding its foundation. In another 2004 column, Johnson again predicted that same-sex marriage could doom America. He wrote, If you were shocked by the moral lapses at the Super Bowl, you ain't seen nothing yet. Experts project that homosexual marriage is the dark harbinger of chaos and sexual anarchy that could doom even the strongest republic. Even worse than Johnson's very strong words about gay marriage and gay people more broadly, though, is the fact that he actually supported the criminalization of homosexuality. Yes, using criminal penalties and the law to make homosexuality illegal. When he was working with ADF, he filed a brief to a Supreme Court case defending the criminalization of homosexuality, and he wrote in an op-ed around that time that, quote, States have many legitimate grounds to proscribe same-sex deviant sexual intercourse. He called it a public health concern. So this is not an example where the left is taking little things or, you know, just the fact that somebody doesn't personally support same-sex marriage and calling them a homophobic bigot or an anti-gay extremist or anti-LGBTQ or any of these other things they throw around like candy on Halloween. It is objectively true, as clear from his own words and writings, that the new Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, 
genuinely did hold extremely radical anti-gay beliefs not that long ago. Those beliefs are completely incompatible with the things that Johnson and the Republicans say they support today, which is, of course, rooted around individual liberty and personal freedom. Take a listen to how Johnson recently described his views. I talked about the core principles of American conservatism, and that's individual freedom, limited government, the rule of law, peace through strength, fiscal responsibility, free markets, and human dignity. And under, under each of those, there would be subcategories. But that's what we stand for. I call them the core principles of American conservatism, but it's really the core principles of America itself. We're different. We're exceptional. So what does Johnson believe these days? That's what I want to know, because... Frankly, I, I know lots of people used to hold pretty anti-gay beliefs, and I'm completely in support of the fact that people evolve and change over time. That's what most Republicans have done. And now, you know, I would say by and large, most people in the Republican Party don't have a problem with gay people. In fact, polls show that a majority of Republicans now even support gay marriage. But the views espoused by Johnson in these old quotes and this wasn't when he was like a college student or something, right? He was in, in his career working at a legal advocacy firm. Uh, these quotes are authoritarian. They're extremist. And yes, they're homophobic. It's also just, it's funny to me to read these back now. Guess what, guys? We legalized gay marriage and we have not, in fact, moved on to allow people to marry their pets or to legalize pedophilia because that was never actually a thing that had to happen. It was always just a form of fear-mongering and alarmism about what would happen if we dared to allow people to marry someone of the same sex. It's also really funny to me that Johnson back in the day warned that homosexuality would end our democratic system, which doesn't even make sense, uh, but whatever, because he was actually one of the biggest Republicans who supported the efforts to deny the 2020 election, which, whether you like it or not, folks, Joe Biden did win. Yet gays are somehow the threat to democracy, not people who are sore losers and couldn't accept that their guy lost an election. But anyway, people absolutely do evolve. So I have an open mind and I want to know what does Speaker Johnson think of these issues now? Does he still support the criminalization of homosexuality? Does he still want to overturn gay marriage? And thankfully, after he became Speaker, he did an interview with Fox News' Sean Hannity, where Hannity asked him about this. And here's his response. Take a listen, and then we'll discuss it. Both in writing and advocacy for this group about homosexuality, calling it sinful, destructive, um, and, and not supporting gay marriage, um, quote, no clear right to sodomy in the Constitution. You have been getting hammered on this. Yeah. And I want to ask you about it. I want to know exactly you know, where you stand. Some of these comments were 15 years ago. I don't even remember some of them. I, I was a I, litigator that was called upon to defend the state marriage amendments. If you remember back in the early 2000s, I think it was over 35 states, somewhere in that number, that, that the people went to the ballot in their respective states and they amended their state constitutions to say marriage is one man, one woman. Well, I was a religious liberty defense lawyer and I was called to go in and defend those cases in the courts. Let me, let me state this very clearly, and, and there's been questions about this. Let me say where I am. Anybody that knows me will tell you this is true. I am a rule of law guy. I made a, a career defending the rule of law. I respect the rule of law. When the Supreme Court issued the Obergefell opinion, that became the law of the land, okay? I respect the rule of law, but I also genuinely love all people, regardless of their lifestyle choices. This is not about the people themselves. I, I am a Bible-believing Christian. Someone asked me today in the media, they said, it's a curious, people are curious, what does Mike Johnson think about any issue under the sun? I said, well, Go pick up a Bible off your shelf and read it. That's, that's my worldview. That's what I believe. And so that's I make your no personal problem. worldview. That's my personal worldview. But here's the thing. Everybody comes to the House of Representatives with deep personal convictions. But all of our personal convictions are not going to become law. That's, this is a, a, a big body of people. There's 435 members in the House. You have to argue and find consensus and all of that. So I have no agenda other than what's best for the American people. So I'm sorry, guys, but that word salad answer doesn't really do anything for me. It doesn't clarify a lot of issues. And I still believe that if you're the Speaker of the House, if you're representing this country, and if you are representing the Republican Party, you should clearly say, if you once supported putting people in jail because of who they are and how, who they love, you should clearly say on the record, no, 
of course I don't want to recriminalize homosexuality. He won't, or hasn't at least, done that. He's just said, well, I respect the rule of law, and those are the cases that have happened now, so I guess we're supposed to just feel reassured by that. I don't feel all that reassured by that, to be honest, because then there's this distinction between his personal beliefs and his political beliefs. But previously, in the past, there was no distinction between his religious beliefs because he tried to enforce them into law. And now he's saying there is, but where is that? Because he's also saying he believes whatever is in the Bible. Well, what does that mean, Speaker Johnson? Because a lot of people disagree about the interpretation of the Bible. There are lots of things in the Bible that some Christians do and don't believe in or don't live by or do or don't agree on how it should be interpreted or which parts are relevant. And also the question is, are you saying that what you believe politically is based on what's in the Bible? Because that's not how our government is supposed to work. You're not supposed to legislate your religious morality and your religious views. You're supposed to have your views and then have your views about the role of government. And they're supposed to be two separate and distinct things. Imagine for a moment that Ilhan Omar said her views are just whatever's in the Quran, and that that would guide her work as a member of Congress. I don't think that would go over too well with Republicans or with Fox News viewers or with the kind of people who maybe on the surface support Mike Johnson. But the principle here is the same. We don't want theocracy in America. We don't want a blending of government and religion. We want those things to be separate and clearly defined spheres. So I'm very concerned about Speaker Johnson's past advocacy, and I of course think people can change and grow, and that's all I would need to hear to alleviate those concerns, but I haven't heard it. And so I'm just left in this, what exactly does he believe these days? How much of his radical advocacy does he now denounce? Uh, how much of it does he still believe? It is a, a very unclear and dispiriting place to see him on these issues. And I really think he owes it to the American people to clear it up, to say exactly what he believes, what his political views are, now that he's going to be in a position of such tremendous power. And if the Republican Party does put at its head somebody who believes in the criminalization of homosexuality, or at least won't say otherwise, and who does want to overturn gay marriage, or at least won't say otherwise, well, guess what, folks? Most of center-right young people are not on board with that old, outdated, authoritarian way of thinking. You're not going to draw them to your message, even the parts of it that they might like about free market capitalism, about individual liberty, about not being woke and insufferable, about not wanting to tear down American values, all these things that many people might like. Well, they're not going to be on board with it if it also means a return to 1970s era theocratic morality. I'm quick to call out and debunk when leftists throw around the homophobic charges like candy on Halloween towards Republicans, but sometimes there is meat to them. And I'm not somebody who's just going to say, you know, anyone on my side can do no wrong. Absolutely not. So I want answers to this. And I think people who are gay and lean right or people who are lean right but support gay rights should also demand answers to these questions because they are uh, serious and they deserve serious consideration and reckoning with not just a couple minutes in a one interview of vague banalities that aren't actually very clarifying or elucidating at all. Hey guys, Brad here, cutting in to make sure that you know that I also host a weekly political podcast called the Based Politics Podcast. If you want to hear me and my co-host Hannah Cox break down the news stories of the week and the internet controversies that are going viral and get our nonpartisan take on what's happening and our opinions, check out the link in the description to subscribe to the Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube channel for the Based Politics Podcast. If you want more, Brad, that's your place to get it. But thanks regardless for tuning in to Damage Control. Up next, a campus group tried to show a documentary about detransitioners and got shouted down by an angry mob that the police caved to. The Post Millennial reports that on Wednesday, authorities moved to shut down a screening of a documentary starring detransitioner Chloe Cole after far-left activists flooded into the venue and disrupted the event at the University of Utah. The event, which was hosted by the University of Utah's Young Americans for Freedom chapter, was shut down by campus police 
after nearly 70 transgender rights activists disrupted the screening for more than 15 minutes with loud chants, according to Yaf's The New Guard. Here's some footage of these deranged protesters trying to shut down the event. The Post Millennial reports that campus police eventually made the decision to cave to this mob and shut down the screening. Instead of forcing the far left activists to leave, police ordered everyone to vacate the venue. They caved to the mob, and these protesters actually cheered when the police denounced this. Take a listen. <laughs> I want to be crystal clear about this. This is despicable and childish behavior. I haven't seen this documentary, I don't know. It could be the worst film in the world, it could be total misinformation propaganda, or it could be very important storytelling about Chloe Cole, about detransitioners who are a real and important community that needs to be listened to. That's people who thought they were trans and then realized they, did, they weren't and regret the things they did to their bodies that can't be undone. Anyway, though, a campus group at a public university has not only every moral right, but even a constitutional right under the First Amendment to screen and show whatever movie they want without angry illiberal mobs of activists coming in and getting to exercise a heckler's veto and shut them down to stop them from expressing ideas they don't like. The police in this incident should have arrested the protesters if they refused to be quiet. They have a right to be there and quietly protest. They don't have a right to shout down or block other people from having an event. What they absolutely shouldn't have done was cave to this unhinged mob and shut down the event, therefore encouraging these activists, giving them exactly what they want, and telling them that we will reward your childish behavior by giving you exactly what you desire. Whatever administrator signed off on this unconstitutional crackdown should face consequences for it because it's absolutely unacceptable. And I don't care whether you're a radical pro-trans person even, you should still want the First Amendment and free speech rights of even and if you think they're anti-trans or whatever you think they are, you should still want their rights protected because those are the same rights that protect you at campuses or spaces where your viewpoint is the minority viewpoint. If you want liberal students at a conservative majority public college to be able to have a film screening and get together and show the latest Michael Moore film or whatever it is these people watch, well, guess what? You have to support the same rights of free expression and free assembly for these folks, because either the schools can shut down unpopular ideas at the behest of mobs, or they can't. And I know what kind of society I want to live in, but these young people, these radical activists and the university administrators who enable them, they need to figure out what they believe in and which standard they want to live in. Because if they don't support those basic rights that are mandated under our constitution, they have no business running a public college funded by our tax dollars. Up next, President Biden just told a story that he's repeatedly told in the past about his evolution and past on gay rights that is too good to be true. At least that's what it seems like. Take a listen. I remember he's dropping me off. I wanted to be, uh, I, I, I wanted to work in the projects as a lifeguard on the east side of Wilmington. And he was dropping me off on his way to work at the city hall to go get an application to be a lifeguard there. And as I got out of the car at the four, four corners in the, the center of town, two men, turns out one going to the Brandywine, one was at work for the, the, uh, the DuPont company, the other worked for Hercules company. This was back when I was a kid. And they leaned up and kissed one another. And I'd never seen that before. And I turned and looked at my dad, and he just looked at me and said, Joey, it's simple. It's simple, Joey. They love one another. It's a simple proposition. So this is actually a sweet story. There's just one problem. It's almost certainly fake and made up. Joe Biden has a long history throughout his career, unfortunately, 
of plagiarizing people, of making up anecdotes that probably aren't true or real, of telling similar stories that are different on many different occasions that are slightly different each time and the facts don't quite add up. And this is one of those instances, even so much so that the fact checkers at the liberal leaning Washington Post have called out the president on the fact that this story does not add up. So the Washington Post fact checker Glenn Kessler wrote this article, Three Reasons to Doubt Biden's Story on His Father and a Gay Kiss. And he goes through and explains why this story is extremely implausible and also why President Biden's recollection of it seems to have changed pretty radically over time. So reading from this, it says, At least since 2014, President Biden has told a version of a story about words his father spoke after a teenage Biden saw two men kissing each other in the early 1960s. The most recent version came when Penn asked Biden what your evolution was like on marriage equality. And actually, the clip I showed you was from an even more recent telling at an HRC event where Biden uh, told this same story. There are three reasons to be skeptical of this story as Biden retells it. Number one, gay men were largely closeted at the time. Biden depicts a scene that would have been unusual 60 years ago. He describes this exchange with his father, usually as taking place in 1961. He said he was seeking to become a lifeguard in the city pool system, and his father dropped him off as at Rodney Square, known as the symbolic center of Wilmington, so he could get a license. That's when he says he, saw, he noticed the two men kiss. But back then, gay men generally did not kiss in public. Many people regarded homosexuality as deviant. Delaware's Rehoboth Beach had some bars regarded then as gay-friendly, but that's not the same as the straight-laced business community in downtown Wilmington. Yeah, I mean, this is the first reason his story was an enormous red flag for me. <laughs> Back when Joe Biden was a teenager, that would have been about the year 1820. Uh, but no, realistically, in the 1960s or whatever, gay men didn't do this. They didn't just walk around holding hands or kissing. It's like extremely implausible that that would have actually happened and that he would have observed it. It's also very implausible that Joe Biden's father, who would have been born a very long time ago, uh, would just be happened to be so woke and open minded in 1960 randomly. It's just the whole thing is, is very hard to believe. The second reason Biden's story is really hard to believe is that the way he's told it and the facts of it have changed pretty remarkably over time. So again, reading from the Washington Post here, a recounting of the story that Biden told Penn appears in Biden's 2017 book, Promise Me, Dad. The earliest Biden appears to have publicly told the story is in 2015 at a celebration of the Supreme Court ruling that legalized same-sex marriages. In 2014, he offered a variation saying he was driving with his father while a junior in high school and saw two men kissing in the next car while they were waiting at a red light. So what was it? Did it happen when he was a lifeguard going to get a permit in the business center, or did it happen when he was driving in a car at a red light? I don't know about you guys, but when I have formative anecdotes or stories from my childhood or whatever, I don't just radically forget or change the setting in which they happened or what was going on in such big ways. But here's the really crazy part. Biden has also told this story where he's the father and he's telling it to one of his kids. Also in 2014, Biden told the New York Times a very different version for a lengthy article that detailed his evolution on same-sex marriage. In this instance, Biden was the father. He described how one of his sons looked up at him quizzically after seeing two men headed off to work kiss each other goodbye on a busy street corner. I said, they love each other, honey, and that was that. So it was never anything that was a struggle in my mind. So was it you as the kid who was told this story? Or did you tell it to your kid? Or are you saying both things happened in almost exactly the same fashion? If your BS alarm isn't ringing by now, you need to get it checked. And the final reason that this story is so hard to believe is that Biden, even for many years after this would have supposedly happened, vigorously opposed same-sex marriage and gay rights more broadly. As the Washington Post writes, even if one accepts Biden heard these enlightened sentiments from his father in the early 1960s, it is not clear that he heeded this lesson for much of his political career. In 1973, as a freshman senator, Biden was startled when a gay activist asked him questions about military and civil service discrimination against homosexuals. My gut reaction, the Wilmington Morning News reported Biden as saying, 
is that they, homosexuals, are security risks. But I must admit I haven't given this much thought, I'll be darned. Then, in 1994, Biden supported an amendment that the Associated Press reported would, quote, cut off federal funds to any school district that teaches acceptance of homosexuality as a lifestyle. In 1996, Biden voted for the Defense of Marriage Act, which defined marriage as only a legal union between one man and one woman as husband and wife. Now look, Biden changed his mind on these issues, and he came out in support of gay marriage in 2012, when he was vice president, even before President Obama had done an about-face on that issue. And that's fine. Honestly, I really wouldn't hold those views against him so much. I mean, a lot of people believed those things at the time, but it's just frustrating and offensive to be gaslit and repeatedly told things that are obviously not true by a president who seems to re want to rewrite the history of his own political career, even though we have records and reportings that undercut it at every turn. Some people are like essentially arguing that why does this matter? It's like the emphasis of his stories or the vibes of acceptance are what really matter. And I, no, I'm sorry. When the president of the United States tells something to the American public and it is a bald faced lie, that is bad. That is wrong. And it's very it was just as wrong when Trump did it. And many liberals that, you know. They didn't say then, right, that with CNN and all these other places that freaked out and fact checked every single Trump fib. They didn't say then, well, it's really about the 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 vibe or the message that he's sending. Well, no, if the president says something that's not true, that's bad and he should be called out by it. Maybe if the media actually applied basic scrutiny to this president more often and shout out to Glenn Kessler at The Washington Post for actually doing that this time. But maybe if more people in the media put more pressure on Biden and called him out when he told these woke fables, essentially, he wouldn't get away with it and just keep doing it over and over and over again. Up next, a Texas high school finds itself in the middle of a controversy after stripping a transgender identifying student of the ability to perform a role that aligns with their gender identity rather than their biological sex. Take a listen to some local news coverage of this event that's getting a lot of attention online. And then we'll discuss it, because my take's probably not what you expect. German high school policy has taken a lead role away from a theater student who identifies as transgender male. News 12's Aaron Pillay spoke with family on how this rule is impacting their student. Senior Max Hightower has been a member of Bearcat Theater all throughout high school. He puts in the effort. This hard work paid off when he landed the lead male role in the play Oklahoma about two weeks ago. It was, it was a beautiful day. But the excitement was cut short. Just days later, the Sherman High School principal called his father, Philip Hightower, to tell him about a new policy. Actors and actresses could only play a role that was the same gender they were assigned at birth. Stripping the lead role from Max. I was devastated. Hightower says his son previously played historically female supporting characters. But they allowed Max to dress up as a male. Something Hightower says has been a part of theater since the start. All kinds of actors have played all kinds of parts. I mean, I... I grew up watching Miss Doubtfire. Hightower thought losing the role would crush his son. I expected him to be crying, but now Max is a fighter. In a statement, the district says the whole show needs to be postponed because of sexual content and profanity, adding there is not a policy on how students are assigned to roles. But for this production, the gender of the roles as identified in the script will be used for casting. This may not apply to future productions. The Hightowers are now determined to get Max back into the role and keep Sherman Theater a safe space for all students. I want every kid to be recognized and noticed and, and allowed to be themselves. The new date for the production will be around mid-January. In Sherman, Aaron Pillay. News 12. So look, I've been very critical of places that are, for example, putting transgender identifying students in girls' sports, even when they can get hurt or it's not fair. And I think we need to have important conversations about all those things, as I have on this show, just like I've cautioned against premature uh, medic medicalization and medical transitioning of minors. But at the same time, some of this is just 
mean-spirited. It's just unnecessary. It just seems like bullying a random trans teenager who isn't doing anything wrong. There's no reason not to allow this person to play a male role if they want to in a school play. That happens all the time in theater, that they actually often don't have enough male participants, so women play male parts, uh, or in some cases, vice versa. I mean, there's a history of that going all the way back to Shakespeare, and for a time that was because women weren't allowed to act, but even since that's no longer the case, thank goodness, uh, it's extremely common. I went to a play a couple of weeks ago where multiple male characters were played by females. Who cares? It's acting. You should be allowed to act, even if it's something you're not technically actually are. I mean, what? Is uh, a P Peter Pan, a can Tinkerbell only be played by an actual fairy? Because I guess we're not going to have a production anytime soon. For me, this is just another example of the culture war over these issues going too far. The pendulum swinging too abruptly back in the backlash. People feel up in arms about the trans activism going too far and all the ways I've cataloged on this show. And so they're just pushing back and they're swinging to opposite extremes. But that's really unfortunate, right? We should be able to have a nuanced conversation about these issues and land somewhere reasonable in the middle, not be reactionaries and just... In all cases, we've got to reject everything, and who cares if it hurts innocent random high schoolers who just want to be in a school play? This is the kind of thing that actually is completely counterproductive, and all the Republicans who flooded my comment section on Twitter or elsewhere saying they agree with this, you're just making yourself look like the actual bigots that people on the left claim you are because you genuinely just want to take something away from someone where it's not hurting anyone. If this person was cast in a male role... Well, it means there probably weren't male people could also try out for that role. And if there were, that means this person they think is better than them. So who cares? There's no unfairness. There's no injustice in the way that there is if you have biological males competing in female sports, for example. So if you just want to take that away from someone, you actually are just being petty and vindictive and just uh, out of backlash or bigotry or whatever your motivations are, you are going too far. You're swinging the pendulum. And it's wrong. I'm sorry, it's wrong to pick on or, or to punish random teenagers because of a culture war. I'm sorry, I don't support it. And it's the kind of thing I will use this show to call out because I think we're better than that. And I don't think that's a society anyone should want to live in, even if they're completely fed up with the woke insanity and the liberal leftism in the LGBT community. We shouldn't be embracing a reactionary uh, backlash to it that becomes just as devoid of nuance as the thing it rose up to confront. All right, guys, up next, it's everybody's favorite part of the show because some of y'all are sadistic little people, let me tell you that. You like to watch me suffer and lose brain cells, so as always, I'm going to react to some unhinged LGBT TikToks. And buckle up, because some of these are, honestly, they're they're crazy even by the standard of this segment, which is is pretty high. Realizing I'm transgender was my personal 9-11. That is to say, it wasn't that big a deal. I kind of had it coming, and it's a really handy excuse for all the awful stuff I do. So I'm praying 100% that that was a joke and completely intended as a joke, because that is so offensive <laughs> to say that 9-11, where thousands of innocent Americans were killed, was not a big deal. And we had it coming. Obviously, we can have a nuanced conversation about the backfiring roles of American foreign policy in the Middle East. But no, those innocent people did not have it coming. That is a vile and evil thing to suggest. And it's so narcissistic and cringe to compare you being trans or having gender dysphoria or whatever your situation may be with the single worst terrorist attack to ever happen to America. I don't know if people like this think they're being funny, but all they're really doing is putting out a message that 99.9% .9 of normal people in the world would see and be like, oh, I don't want anything to do with that. Is that what the LGBT community is like? Because if, if it is, then I don't want to support that. So please, you're not funny. You're not helping. Just stop. Stop posting this stuff. It's, it's I mean, it's good for me because I get to laugh at you and react to you and, and get a lot of views uh, and destroy my brain cells in the process but hey i still got the face at least i guess but for the world on behalf of society i'm begging you please stop posting i've been thinking a lot about gender recently so i recently realized that i'm autistic as well as you know a host of other uh letters and stuff and i've generally been like fine with my gender um 
but at the same time, it's never really felt quite cozy to me. But I've, you know, TikTok thinks I'm trans for sure. I'm seeing just like so many amazing, beautiful trans people show up on my feed. And uh, honestly, it's been really inspiring. And I've always, I've always been a supporter of trans rights and queer rights. And, uh, you know, I guess I'm only recently coming to realize that there might also be my rights. And I'm sorry. Stop. No. <laughs> this is the whole, like, my culture is not your prom dress thing, right? Like, that was kind of cringe. But actually, the real case of this is that normal LGBT people don't claim random people on TikTok who get confused all of a sudden and think they might be queer, whatever that means. If you were actually trans, if you actually had gender dysphoria, you would have a long history of feeling deeply uncomfortable with your body and having been deeply uncomfortable with your sex assigned at birth your whole life or most of your life since uh, since an early age. You wouldn't suddenly be wondering if that's you because of a TikTok rabbit hole you've fallen down under. And how many of these videos do I have to show y'all before people stop insisting that there's not any, not even a little bit of a social contagion element or phenomenon going on with the rapid uptick in people identifying as different genders. Sure about that one, Susan? Up next, this person had a very bad experience at Taco Bell. Disgusting. I just went through the Taco Bell drive through because I'm a whore for Taco Bell. And do you know how they greeted me? They said, hello, ma'am. And then after handing me my food, said, thank you, ma'am. Have a good day. What what about me says ma'am? I have a fucking red mullet. So I'm happy to answer your question, honey. What about you says ma'am? Everything, to be honest, everything. But of course, you're going through a drive through at Taco Bell and somebody hears your voice. They're going to assume you are a female, which you are. And they're going to assume you identify as a woman because 99.9% .9 of females do. And so they're going to call you ma'am. It's not a big deal. Like, you're really this upset about it? You're really going to make it a whole TikTok video? You're really going to act like you've just been victimized? Also, can we talk about the fact that Taco Bell, their food's crusty anyway. Like, it's genuinely gross. Like, I, I, I'm not against, I'm not some snob. I eat my fast food, right? My McDonald's, Burger King, but Taco Bell? Ugh. What's that meat even made out of? Hmm? Is that even really meat? Once again, it's just like, I almost feel bad for these people because their sense of self is so fragile that like the slightest non-affirmation from the world around them sends them into a spiral and a spin that they, some for some bizarre reason, continually feel the need to catalog on TikTok. I mean, as a gay person, I've experienced something not dissimilar where I'll meet somebody and they'll just assume I have a wife or they'll ask if I have a girlfriend or whatever. They'll make an assumption about me that isn't in line with my own identity. And you know what I do in response to those moments? I either politely correct them, or sometimes I don't, depending on the context. And regardless, I just cope. Like an adult. Like somebody with a fully formed, mature sense of self, and with the emotional resiliency of an adult rather than that of a toddler. It's really not that deep, babe. It's really not that profound that somebody in a drive through called you ma'am. Like, buckle your seatbelt, put on a helmet, you'll be okay. And if you're not okay after this such a harrowing experience, that's a you problem. That's something you need to work on and improve. And it's not something that you need to project to the entire internet and claim to somehow be a victim. Up next, this trans TikToker is going mega viral right now after going around and filming herself uh, being misgendered at restaurants and putting these people on blast. It looks like uh, he's having a uh, nice piece. She, all she, she, her. Yeah, it's okay. It's all good. But it was not all good. Hi. I use she, her pronouns. I'm not sir. Yeah, like, it, it. it's like a knife in the heart. I also, I did specifically ask ahead of time not to be called sir. Yeah, I'm just gonna go. Okay. The so sweet water starts at, okay. Yes, okay. Not, I mean, not, I, I'm so sorry. I apologize. It's just always like a knife. It always hurts every single time. I was wondering if there's a manager I could talk to about something that happened. Yeah, I, I was called sir. Oh, okay. I just really sucks every time it happens. I don't need to be called ma'am. I just need to not be called sir, you know?
Thank you. Did you call me, sir? I, I just want to tell you that the person who gave me this called me sir. What? Call me sir. Oh. Uh, it's just like, it kind of just hurts a lot to get called sir. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. Very good. Right. Thank, Thank you so you, much. Sir. No. Oh, I'm, yeah. Thank you. I'm not a sir. <sighs> Nothing like a good misgendering. It does, it is a knife in the gut when I get called sir. I, f I feel like I need to tell him. <laughs> I need to tell him that that hurt. It hurts more, though, and it's not intentional because it means like this. The, this is sir to him. I know you didn't mean it, but I'm not a sir. I'm so sorry. It's okay. I know you didn't mean it. It's just you know, it hurts. I know when people clock me, it's it's fine, but like it does kind of hurt. Thank you. I'm not sir. Oh, sorry. Not sir. Not sir. But the guy who dropped the, the, the food off, he called me sir twice in a row. Thank you, I appreciate that. So I have thoughts on this. One, this person has a cute dog, and I like the little hat on the dog. I did I did like I did love that. But two, I have a little bit of sympathy for the plight of a trans person who is genuinely has severe gender dysphoria is not able to pass and is constantly misgendered as a result. I do have sympathy. That must be hard. And yet you think it's okay to expose them on the internet because they can't keep up with your pronouns. This person really thought that she was going to post this and we were be like, oh, I feel so bad for you. But no, most people look at this video and think you're the jerk because you went around setting these people up to fail uh, and to make yourself look like a victim and get pity points when in reality i mean are we supposed to pity you that you have this lifestyle that you can apparently just go around to all these restaurants all the time like i, I get that bag i'm not gonna money shame someone but yeah all the people i'll scroll into tiktok who can't afford groceries see you at all these this fine dining and somebody called you sir so they're supposed to feel bad for you like no susan we're not gonna feel bad for you you clearly live a privileged life and i'm happy for you but to go and find the most minute of interactions and attempt to exploit them for victimization points on TikTok isn't a good look. And while I get that it's not, it must not feel nice as a trans person to be misgendered, if it really feels like a knife in the heart, that's kind of a you problem in that it suggests that you are insecure, you don't really believe that you actually are the gender that you're claiming you are, and you're still dependent on other people's validation because you don't fully accept yourself as a trans person. You don't have a right to bleed on other people. I mean, you have a right to work through your own issues, to have your own problems that you're dealing with, but they, it's not okay to force them onto other people and to force such a tremendous cost to you on their word choice that in 99.9% .9 of cases in everyday life they use and it's just a habit and they are not thinking or meaning anything by it and yet you interpret it like a knife to the heart, that's on you ultimately. That's not on them. Because their words only have the power on you that you let them have. And you have set yourself up in a scenario where you are dependent on the world for validation because you don't have a strong enough sense of self. And then, frankly, you're, you're going out there with unrealistic expectations and demands because you don't pass and it's not particularly close. And maybe you should spend a little more time working on that and working on yourself than you do trying to uh, exploit random people in the real world for internet victim clout. All right, guys, I can't handle anything more from alphabet people on TikTok without incurring permanent brain damage. If you want to reward my suffering, consider dropping a like, commenting, subscribing, yada, yada, yada. And regardless, I'll see you all in my next video. If you want more damage control, check out my recent episodes with Blair White or Buck Angel.